Howdy. Welcome, Senator. We are so glad that you are here in Iowa with us. Thanks Thank for joining you. us. Absolutely. Thank yeah. you. And I'm going to start this off before I get into policy with a little bit of a personal question. Yes, ma'am. All right. So other than your mama, yeah. is there any special lady in your life? Yes. So if you haven't read about her yet, I don't, I'm not sure why not. It's in one of the more asked questions recently. I do. I'm dating a lovely Christian girl. One of the things I love about the gospel of Jesus Christ is it points us always in the right direction. Proverbs 18:22 says, he who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. So can we just pray together for me? So yes, I'm very excited. Very excited. That's good. Sounds like you found a good one. So important. I have. Yeah. You know, I think it's so important. As a guy who was raised in a single parent household, mired in poverty, I understand the devastation when a family breaks up. I had to live with the consequences of a father who was not there. I made a commitment to make sure that never happened in my life. I'm so thankful to know a risen Savior that has helped guide my way, and I'm so thankful that he's allowed my life to intersect at the right time with the right person. And I just say, praise the living God. Amen. Yeah. Well, I love what you're saying about the importance of the family and fathers and, and whole healthy families. What will you do as president to strengthen the family unit? Yeah, one of the things I started this journey in 1994 when I started volunteering at the Crisis Pregnancy Center in my town, the Low Country Crisis Pregnancy Center. I also, in 1995-96, became the chairman of the South Carolinians for Healthy Family Formation. And so one of the things that I know that works is for us to make sure that we protect adoption and crisis pregnancy centers so that we have the kind of funding for those organizations that protect and promote life that the Planned Parenthood gets as well. We need to balance the stages and balance the scales to make sure that our organizations that encourage and promote life have the resources to do exactly that. The second thing we can do The second thing we can do is make sure that we, and from the tax policies of this country, we make it easier for families to choose life. I'm a big believer in Jeremiah 1.5 that says, While you were in, before you were in your mother's womb, I knew you. I chose you. I crafted you for a specific purpose. Jeremiah was crafted to be a prophet. And one of the things I'd like to do is to uh, provide tax benefits once a woman gets pregnant. Because we should be pro-life from the moment of conception until birth and then beyond as well. So I would redesign the tax code to reflect that faith-filled position. Well, we have a lot of people here in this room who would support school choice. It's a pretty important issue here in Iowa. I know it's something that's uh, important to you and you've been involved in that issue for a long time. What would you do as president to make sure that families and parents have choices for their kids' education? I would take the model of Governor Kim Reynolds in this great state and make it a nationwide model. <laughs> Think about what's happened here. You have a $7,500 tax credit available for everyone within 300% of poverty. Next year, it goes to 400% of poverty. And then the following year, it's universal. I would take the two major buckets of resources that come from the federal government, Title I money for those kids going to failing or underperforming schools, put that money in a proverbial backpack and let it follow the kid. When the parent has a choice, the kids have the best chance for success. And then the second thing I would do is I would put a target on the backs of the teachers' unions and break their backs. They're destroying our kids, trapping them in failing schools. Not on my watch. I will stand in the fire and make sure that kids growing up in poverty, kids growing up in rural America, have the quality education as a choice. The good news as Americans, the future is not gonna be determined by the color of our skin. 
but it will be determined by the quality of our education. Let's equip our kids. Great words, and uh, let me ask you this one. I was homeschooled. What do you think about homeschooling? Well, somebody say praise the Lord. <laughs> Listen, one of the things I have, a few, in my, a few of the folks that work for me are homeschool parents. I spoke three years in a row to the Low Country Homeschool Organization. It's called La Chia. It's a Low Country uh, Organization for Homeschooling in South Carolina. I finally said, y'all need to get a new speaker because these kids are getting kind of bored. But the truth is that there are tax impediments. The 529 plans, homeschool parents don't have the same access to 529 plans as to other Folks, you should have the same access to the tax benefits in the tax code as a homeschool parent. Actually, if you think about it, you're paying taxes for someone else's kid to go to school, and then you're punished because you can't get a tax credit for educating your own kid. That's just wrong. Well, we know that tax and spending policies really do influence what people can do and not do, right? Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. So uh, there's a lot going on in Washington right now with the federal budget. Yes. Okay? Uh, let us know where you stand on that and uh, whether you would shut down the federal government. Where's your line in the sand? Yeah, so if we, one of the things that, the best way to know what a guy is going to do or a gal is going to do is see what they've already done. And so we just recently had a debt deal done in le several months ago, if you recall that deal. What that deal did was it gave unlimited credit card spending to Joe Biden until January of 2025. I voted no. And as Christians, I would say Gehenna no, if you know what I mean. It's just wrong. And so unless we have a deal that controls spending, I'm an absolutely, positively, undeniably no again. We have to protect our next generation. The way we protect the next generation is to control our spending. We also need a balanced budget amendment to stop federal folks from spending money we don't have. Well, I'm, I'm 47, and I think uh, I have... 37? I'm sorry. 47. Oh, oh yeah, okay. gee, there's a good strategy right there. Yeah, yeah. Hallelujah. Thank you, by the way. Thank you. Truth uh, will set you free, John 8, 32. Yeah, go, go, go. There you go, yes. there you go. Um, but I think I've been hearing ever since my earliest memories of politics, people saying about we need to balance the budget, but it's really never happened, has it? I mean, what are we really going to do to get spending and the federal government under control? There are a few things you have to do. The first thing you have to do to get this federal spending under control is to fire Joe Biden. That's number one. Yep. Number two, you have to recognize that a nation that spends $7 trillion knowing it's only going to bring in this fiscal year $4.9 trillion is reckless. We cannot have this government spending 40% more than we know it's going to bring in. The fastest way for us to cut spending is to go back to pre-pandemic levels of spending, which, we, which would be the 2019 budget. That would save us at least a half a trillion dollars in over a 10 year period of time. I believe it would save us closer to two trillion dollars because if we continue the current trajectory of spending, it just goes up like a rocket. If we went back to, there's no longer COVID by the way, it, we can't, use that as an excuse. Someone say, thank God, right? So if we went back to the levels of spending before we had a crisis, it would reduce our spending by billions of dollars. And then the long-term growth would, would, would go down, not up. We need to use common sense when making these decisions. The other thing I would say we need to do is go to zero-based budgeting. Just because you got it last year don't mean you get it this year. Mm -hmm. That's called crazy. And my language. So if we did that, and then finally, new concept. The government's too big in Washington. Let's close some agencies, consolidate some, and freeze vacant positions so you can't fill them. Yeah. yeah. Well, 
with the remaining time we've got left, I'm going to ask. We only you, have 30 minutes. so 30 minutes. Okay. 30 no. seconds. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm going to ask you a question I think is probably an easy one. Yes, ma'am. Uh, COVID vaccine mandates. Bad. Oh, there you go. There's an easy one. Bad. Yep. I said it during COVID, and I'll say it now, too. We should never, ever have mandates. I trust people to make their own right decisions. One of the worst decisions made in the history of the country on education. We trapped poor kids all across this nation out of education. And their scores went down and crime went up. Unemployment went up. That was immoral what happened then. No mandates. And if your kid can't go to the school where they're supposed to go to, under my legislation I sign as president, they can go to any other school that's open. Catholic school, public school, private school, home school, virtual school, all kind of schools. All right. <laughs> I know well, my time is up. Yeah, thank you. Let's give a warm Iowa welcome to Senator Tim Scott. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much.